Hi, it's Dwyer, keeping it free. Blogspot.com for my law firm site, RichardDwyer.com. Let's talk about a case that's troublesome. Here online, when we re examine cases, sometimes I'll reach the conclusion that the accused was actually guilty. Right? That's my opinion in the Amanda Knox case. I know Knox ultimately won an appeal, but um, I believe she did the crime. That's also my opinion in the Reuben Hurricane Carter case. From time to time, though, I stumble upon cases where I believe the person is innocent. And my own belief is I would rather see a guilty person go free than to see an innocent person wrongly convicted of murder, which is what I believe happened to John Maloney. I hope you Google this case. Out of Green Bay, Wisconsin, who was convicted of killing his wife, who he was getting a divorce from, on the day before a hearing in that divorce case. Right now, understand Maloney himself was a fire investigator. He was a cop. If you believe the prosecution, Maloney would have to be surgical in his time management to pull off this crime. One wonders what the motive would be, too, because, understand, Maloney had already obtained custody of his kids, right? His wife only had supervised visitation. The court recognized that his wife had a major drinking problem. Understand, when her body was found, her blood alcohol level was over not 0.1, it was over 0.2. Understand, the estimate on her actual blood alcohol level at the time of her death is over 0.3. Understand, too, she was on anti-seizure medication. Her body was found nude, waist up, face down on her sofa, burned to death. Right, Maloney? as I said earlier, was a fire investigator. The argument is that he would have the expertise in knowing how to burn a body, right? Also, in analyzing her body, it looked like there wasn't the level of soot in her lungs that one would believe should have been there if she had died of smoke inhalation. Rather, the prosecution theory is that she was actually strangled and then left on that sofa while she was set on fire by someone who then left the house, leaving her burning right on the sofa. The fire ultimately peters out Right, because whoever did this didn't leave an open enough window to actually have oxygen come in so that the fire could engulf the house. Right, we'll get back to the murder scene a little later in this video. But first, let's talk about the timeline. Let's talk about the prosecution's theory behind the case. And what you also need to know is that the prosecutor of this case would later be found to have rigged several criminal cases. He's now a convicted felon, folks. Right? The prosecutor was later determined to be dirty on other matters. Let's look under the hood here and see if it's possible that Maloney could have done this crime. Now understand, Maloney had just bought a new townhouse with his girlfriend, right? 
The day of the murders, Maloney is with at least two of his sons. His sister comes, right, Aunt Jenny, to pick up one son, to take one son to some activity, perhaps Little League, something like that. Maloney's at home with his other son, who's under 10 years of age. I believe the other son's something like 8 years old at that time. And they're building a bunk bed. Right? Here's what we know. That 8-year-old son claims that daddy never left the house. Never. We know that 30 to 40 minutes later, his girlfriend shows up at the house. Maloney's there. So if you buy the prosecution's theory of the case, in that 30 to 40 minute period of time, Maloney would have had to have driven to his girlfriend's house, strangled her, then torn up pieces of tissue, put them between the cushions on the sofa, Right, started a fire, left the house, driven back to his house, convinced his eight-year-old son that he had never left, and then be cool, calm, and collected so when his current girlfriend comes home, he's there as if nothing happened. Right, now, understand the most damning piece of evidence in the entire case. The prosecutor wasn't the only one who had problems, right? Understand Maloney's girlfriend at the time apparently had lied on her job application for the IRS. She worked for the IRS. She herself was an investigator. So the prosecution leaned on her and said, look, you could lose your job. You need to play ball with us. Now keep in mind, she, if you believe the prosecution theory, doesn't have any idea what happened that day, right? Because she's not even home for the 30 to 40 minutes, right? She's not present when this murder is alleged to have taken place. So the prosecution instead <laughs> convinces her that she has to help them get a confession from her boyfriend, John Maloney. So she tapes a conversation the two of them have on a vacation in Vegas. Right, I believe she may have moved to Vegas. Maloney goes and visits her. This is couple time alone, right? Several times on the tape, and I mean several times on the tape, she asked Maloney if he did the crime, if he had anything to do with the crime. And Maloney says, no, I didn't. Right, you know, it's a ridiculous question. No, I didn't kill my wife, right? No, I was, you know, with my son. Right, as his son firmly believes. Well, then, after hours, right, and keep in mind, there are portions of the tape where the couple actually get off camera, right? Maloney doesn't know they're being taped, right? His girlfriend maneuvers them off camera so they can make love. The tape is bizarre. I encourage you to Google this case. But there is a moment on the case after Maloney has denied any involvement in the murder repeatedly where the following exchange takes place. His girlfriend, her name is Tracy, she says, why didn't you push 911 and run? Maloney says, oh, why would I? Girlfriend, you didn't want to? Maloney, what would be on the phone then, huh? Girlfriend, your fingerprints. Maloney, right. And where would the call have come from? Girlfriend, did you go there to do it? Maloney, 
No. Girlfriend. Why did you go there then? Maloney. To get done with the divorce. To get it over with. Right? Now the prosecution parlayed this statement between a boyfriend and his girlfriend into their theory that Maloney leaves his son while they're building a bunk bed. By the way, even the girlfriend concedes the bunk bed gets built. Right? The question is, how did it get built? Could an eight-year-old have built the bunk bed on his own? Or do you believe an adult was there with the eight-year-old as both of them claim building the bunk bed? Right? Because the bunk bed gets built that night. According to the prosecution, Maloney goes over to his soon-to-be ex-wife's place. Right? He goes over there to make sure that she's going to show up at the divorce hearing the next day. Right? In other words, his sister takes one son, then he slips out of the house. Eight-year-old who must be Einstein building this bunk bed, doesn't realize that dad has left. So dad, without telling anyone, leaves, goes over to his wife's place, comes out, she's very intoxicated. We know that from the blood alcohol level, right? From the autopsy. She's very intoxicated. He shows up, this divorce had been lingering, right? An argument breaks out. Right? He's there to say, hey, you need to make sure that you make tomorrow's hearing. An argument breaks out. He strangles her, takes off her top, places her face down on the sofa. There's cigarettes all around the place, many of them half smoked. His wife's a chain smoker. Now, either you believe that he stages the scene. You believe that he shows up and she happens to have many half-smoked cigarettes all over the home, right? Her kids, by the way, say that was her modus operandi. This was a woman who didn't always use ashtrays. Keep in mind, she has an alcohol problem, right? Or you believe that in this half hour, John Maloney shows up at the house to discuss a divorce, strangles his wife, and then stages it himself half smoked several cigarettes plants them all over the place to make it look like she dozed off smoking a cigarette and then the sofa goes up in flames right then Maloney after of course putting tissues in places uses an accelerant understand this is part of the prosecution theory no one sees Maloney with an accelerant Right? He you know, his kids don't see him with an accelerant leave the house. His eight-year-old doesn't even see him leave the house. By the way, no one sees him leave the house. According to the prosecution, he uses an accelerant. Right? That's, of course, according to the prosecutor who later becomes a convicted felon. Right? He uses an accelerant. He makes sure that his wife's sofa is burning as he leaves the house. Of course, he doesn't open the window wide enough, so later the wife's body is discovered. The fire has burned itself out. There isn't enough wind in the house to completely burn things. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The basement. There's blood in the basement. Right? They're bloody footprints in the basement. There's an electrical cord made into a noose hanging from the ceiling of the basement. Now it's on a pipe. It doesn't look like it was used, right? There's no indication that someone actually hung themselves from the cord. But it's in a noose and it's hanging from the ceiling as if someone was contemplating suicide. Worse yet, there are two VCRs on the table below the noose. 
It looks like someone was actually going to try to climb up on the VCRs to hang themselves. Right? In the hamper is a bloody shirt. You remember, the wife is found burned to death on the sofa, right on the main floor. This is the basement we're talking about now, on the main floor without a shirt on. Well, guess what? There's a bloody shirt in the hamper. There's even a fingerprint pulled off the blood. It's a fingerprint of the wife's best friend, who apparently had a key to the house. Right? So understand, it looks like someone was bleeding, walked into the shower, washed off some blood from themselves. Right? Bloody footprints leading to the shower. Bloody shirt in the hamper. The prosecution wants you to believe that the basement scene is irrelevant. Right? They want you to believe. Because keep in mind, there's even evidence downstairs based on the luminol spray that lights up blood that someone tried to wipe off a lot of the blood downstairs. The prosecution and really what is an academic argument wants to argue that we don't know how long the blood was downstairs. We don't. The friend whose fingerprints in the blood, she claims she wasn't at the house that day. Right? No, no. The prosecution wants you to believe that Maloney interacts with his wife on the ground floor, strangles her, lights the sofa, and leaves. She just happens to be topless. Right? The bloody shirt in the hamper downstairs, that could have been left there days ago. Let me add another wrinkle. The police also find several suicide notes at the residence written by the wife who had an alcohol problem. Several. Right? Now, let me just say, aren't there problems with this case? Is there even a crime? Don't you feel there's a link between the fact that the victim, alleged victim, is found without a shirt on? And that there's a shirt in the hamper in the basement that has her blood all over it. Right? She also has a cut on her head. The prosecution wants you to believe that that cut was caused by John Maloney. Was the cut caused by John Maloney or was this woman who wrote several suicide notes trying to hurt herself? The noose hanging from the basement. Whether it's used or not, doesn't it show a contemplation of wanting to commit suicide? The prosecution argues that she's dead before the fire is lit. There isn't enough soot in her lungs to suggest that she died of smoke inhalation. Right? But understand, her blood alcohol levels over 0.2. How do we know she doesn't lie down on the sofa after trying to kill herself downstairs and then black out? You've heard of that term. Be in some kind of alcohol induced coma. How do we know she hasn't blacked out while smoking a cigarette that ultimately ignites? the sofa and causes the fire. If John Maloney wanted to get away with murder by arson, who better than the fire investigator that he was would know to open a window to have the house get engulfed in flames, but yet he didn't do so.
if you believe he's even over at the house. Let's go back to his conversation with his girlfriend, right? The one who is secretly taping this for police, right? It's a videotape. Let's go back to it. Is there anyone watching this video who, after telling a loved one repeatedly, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it for hours. Might then at some point in the conversation play devil's advocate, ask hypothetical questions of the person to explore why the person thinks they did it, or just say things to end the conversation? Let's go back to that conversation that's taped. Is this a confession to you? Where, you know, his girlfriend said, did you go there to do it? And he responds, no. Right? You know, where she says things like, why didn't you push 911 and run? And he responds by saying, oh, why would I? Do these statements sound like a convincing confession to you? Also, why are we discounting the testimony of his son? who believes daddy never left the house. Why are we discounting the fact that the bunk bed gets built? Well, if Aunt Jenny picks up son number one, and then 30 to 40 minutes later, his girlfriend comes home, right? when exactly is this bunk bed built? Isn't it? Logical to think it's built during this period of time? And so, let me say, the prosecution really has an unbelievable theory here that doesn't fit their own timeline, right? Why wouldn't the basement be part of the crime scene since it has bloody footprints and the victim's blood and stuff like that. And since she has a head injury, right? Keep in mind, the body's charred. We don't quite know how much she was bleeding shortly before her death, right? Why does the prosecution try to ignore the obvious? She's topless. There's a top in the basement and it's soaked in blood. There are bloody footprints no one has cleaned up. Right? If she's writing suicide notes, and if there's blood in the basement no one's cleaned up, isn't it reasonable to conclude that something happened recently that caused that blood in the basement that hadn't yet been cleaned up? That there's a link between her suicide notes, her being topless on the ground floor, and there being a bloody shirt in the garbage in the basement? Let me ask you to, let's say the basement is part of the crime. Let's say John Maloney is over there and he's part of why the blood is in the basement, right? How come no one that night sees any blood on him? Understand, no one sees him with an accelerant. Right? No one sees him with any blood on him. Right? Think about it. But yet, he's supposed to have done this crime. Let me point out, too, that there's vodka all over the place. His wife's alcohol of choice was vodka. Right? His children maintain that his wife used to put half-lit cigarettes all over the place. In other words, she was in bad shape, folks, right? She would drink vodka, she would roll up tissues and try to swab at her eye to get things out of her eye. One of her sons believes that the, you know, photos, the crime scene photos that show some tissue off at the side just show 
tissues that mom used to always have around her. Right? Why is the testimony of the children being actively ignored? After all, the victim was their mother. And so I encourage you to look at this case. Um, I have no idea, none whatsoever, why the idea that someone came in the house and kill this woman is supposed to be more likely than this woman having an alcohol-induced coma while smoking a cigarette on her sofa after having had some incident in the basement in which she's trying to kill herself. How this case reaches the legal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt is completely beyond me. Let me say this too. Pathologists have looked at this case. Even the idea of her having been strangled is questionable. Understand their medical explanations for, right, the hemorrhaging around her eyes and other, you know, physical indications that she may have been strangled. Understand there might not be a lot of soot in her lungs because she may have passed out before the house became engulfed in flames. Right? So somehow, on this flimsy evidence, a prosecutor who would later become a convicted felon for wrongdoing while in office was able to secure a conviction John Maloney right now has been in prison for, I believe, you know, uh, certainly more than 15 years for this alleged crime. Looking at the reports, it looks like his lawyer was terrible. His lawyer seemed to concede that this was a murder. Why make that concession based on this evidence? Right? Someone writing multiple suicide notes that the police uncover who has a blood alcohol level above 0.2 who is shirtless with a bloody shirt in the basement. Understand why the prosecution had to make the claim that the basement had nothing to do with the crime. Because given the timeline, it's not mathematically possible for John Maloney to have gone over the house, right, been involved in an incident in the basement, wiped it up as much as the luminol suggests the blood was wiped up, right? Keep in mind, there's still bloody footprints and stuff like that, right? And then staged the murder on the ground floor before racing back home to be home when his girlfriend arrived, right? Understand, if Maloney is guilty of this, it would rank as one of the most poorly thought out crimes ever because it would be vulnerable to his son saying, hey, dad left, right? Dad left me here. Dad wasn't home for that half hour. And understand, his son doesn't say that, right? His son says, Daddy was with me. So this case is an outrage. I encourage you to look it up. The wrongfully convicted person's name is John Maloney, right? He was a police officer. I believe he was a victim of having a very bad defense lawyer, the defense lawyer's claim at trial, by the way, was, of course, that somebody else committed the murder. And that somebody else was his girlfriend. Right? In other words, the theory sounds ridiculous as I say it. Right? That was 
his defense lawyer's argument. The defense lawyer should have alerted the jury to the fact that the forensic evidence showed that this woman may well have killed herself, right? Drunk herself into a stupor, you know, laid down on the sofa, um, house is burning. She may have thought, okay, well, I'm just going to die this way. After creating a bloody mess in the basement, that didn't work, right? Keep in mind, as I said earlier, there's a noose hanging from the ceiling in the basement, right? An electrical cord made into a noose. Understand, the prosecution doesn't contend that John Maloney created the noose in the basement, right? There's a lack of forensic evidence that John Maloney has any participation in the victim, alleged victim, bleeding in the basement. Right? Look up this case. It's an outrage. Let's hope that some governor has the courage to do the right thing and pardon this cop. Right? All three of his sons support him. They all believe, and they knew their mothers, right? They, they knew their mother. All three of them believe that he was innocent, right? The eight-year-old has now grown up, and the eight-year-old says, look, there's no way I could have put that bunk bed together by myself. Give it a look. John Maloney, Wisconsin. Thanks for stopping by.